Testing, testing, I'm on. Shabbat Shalom. It's almost like Rosh Hashanah. There are so many of you here. More. Uh, it's really a pleasure for all of us to be here. This is going to be a very relaxed service. Not that it wasn't relaxed in Rosh Hashanah, but we can really just kind of take a deep breath and let's relax into our new year, into the first Shabbat of our new year. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat the Jewish calendars that we all get, usually this time of year, right? We get them because the cemeteries are very generous and give us a calendar. There's always a time written for Shabbat candle lighting. And I always find that very arbitrary because it might be a time where I'm not at all ready for Shabbat to begin. And I never believe in those times. I believe that Shabbat begins when we're ready to welcome Shabbat. We do that by singing together. We do that by praying together. We do that by creating a sense of community. I'm Rabbi Don Gore. We're joined on the Bema by Rabbi Josh Aronson, Rabbi Cantor Allison Wissett, and Cantor Evan Kent. That's who we are. Take a quick moment to say Shabbat Shalom to somebody near you. If you haven't met some people in front or behind you, to say Shabbat Shalom. And now that you know each other so well, now that everybody feels at home, <laughs> if you turn in your Cedarim to page 120, is that right? We're about to light. See, that's part of Shabbat too, is that sense of community. We're about to light our Shabbat candles. It's the tradition now to invite young people who are maybe 13 or younger to come join us to welcome Shabbat in. So if you're 13 or younger, come on up. Kaylee, Amanda. Hey, Jacob. How are you? <laughs> Hi, Jasmine. Hey, Daniel. I like your glasses. Hi, Abby. Come and join us, all of you. Got you guys coming here. Aha. I didn't see Maddie up there before. The Shabbat blessing is on page 120. Let's see if I can get this to work. <laughs> what do you do? Nothing. We can push something. <laughs> Josh. Josh, help. We need Rabbi Aronson. <laughs> Aha. 
I was about to say we don't have this technology in Israel. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cover up your eyes, everybody. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kitshanu Page 142, Shalom Aleichem, the Shabbat Angels. Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Shalvet, Malachi Elion. It's always the rabbi's fault. <laughs> is, we like to clap on beats two, two and, four. and four. However, the rabbi children... who has no rhythm. Oh, hold it, hold it. In fairness, Tanner, when do I clap? Two and four. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just want to point that out. This rabbi who has no rhythm. <laughs> Most Jews actually have no rhythm and clap on one and three. That's kind of normal. <laughs> That's why we were laughing. <laughs> this Shabbat has a name. Not every Shabbat has a name. Most Shabbatot are just Shabbat. This Shabbat is Shabbat Shuvah, which means the Shabbat of return. And rabbis like to say it's the Shabbat where actually nobody returns. <laughs> but the fact is you've all proven us wrong, and we're very grateful that you're here. It's the Shabbat Shuvah because of a text that says, return unto God. And it's really a beautiful text from the prophets. It says... God no longer wants the sacrifice of animals. God wants the sacrifice of your hearts. And so it says, take with you words to come back to God. And that's really our challenge during these 10 days, the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We can't enter the sanctuary on Yom Kippur without having done our work. Our work is to reflect and see where we've gone astray in the past year. Our work is then to use words and turn to others and ask for forgiveness where we've gone wrong. It's also, by the way, to give 
forgiveness when people come to us. And then the final act is to come to Yom Kippur services because only then can we truly be forgiven. Only after we've done our work and returned through words can God accept the sacrifice of our heart. So your being here is beginning your journey that began with Rosh Hashanah and leads to Yom Kippur. May the words that we will pray tonight and the songs that we will sing, the prayers that we will utter, help us in that work of returning to God. We continue in our Sidurim with L'cha Dodi on page 138. L'cha Dodi to greet the Sabbath bride. She's about to come in the doors, but she's waiting for us to welcome her.
page 263, Chatzik Kaddish. At each age, we are challenged by our ancient teaching. At each moment, we stand face to face with truth. In each age, we add wisdom to that which has gone before. At each moment, the knowing heart is filled with wonder. In each age, the children of Torah become its builders and seek to set the world firm on a foundation of truth. Shema is on 267. Chantez-vous, 
بشینان تا هم لبانه ها به دیوار تا هم بشیب تخواب به تخواب او لخت خواب آترخ او شخ به خواب او کونه ها او شد هم لعود آیده ها به هیول تو تفاد بینه نه ها او خطاب تا هم آن مزوزاد به تخا او بیشاره خا لمان تیز که رو و آسی تمت کمیز و تای وی تم که روشیم لیلوی خم آنی آدونای لیلوی خم آشه هد سید خم مهرت میترایم لیاد لخم لیلویم آنی آدونای لیلوی Now in that period from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, and what we're seeking is redemption. We're seeking the opportunity to be redeemed for our sins, for our mistakes, for our transgressions, for that which we have not done as we should have done during the past year. And of course, the archetypical moment of redemption in the history of our people is the moment that is commemorated by the Song of the Sea, the Mika Mocha, on page 270. <laughs>
second prayer as we prepare for the Amidah, the Shamru, which also begins to set the stage for the Amidah by emphasizing the relationship of the Jewish people to that unique gift of God, Shabbat. Adonai, open up my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu, Velohe Avotenu, Veimotenu, Elohe Abraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Velohe Yaakov, Elohe Sara, Elohe Rivka, Elohe Rachel, Velohe Leah, Ha'el Hagadol, Hagibor, Ve'Hanora, 
different uses. And uh, we've come in our movement and in many movements that we think of the Mishaberach immediately as the blessing of healing, and that's, of course, one major use for the blessing. It also is a blessing you can use. I've been trying to teach you for many other things, whether you're celebrating a wedding anniversary or the eve of a wedding or the birth of a child or lots of good things. So this evening I want to start with some good, uh, kind of a Misha Bera for the good. And that is that uh, what a joy so far the holy days have been for Temple Judea, at least from my perspective. It's been just uh, an exhilarating experience. And part of that has been the opportunity to share the holy days with uh, this clergy team up here that's been wonderful. It's been wonderful to have, it's been a blessing for me to have our Rabbi Emeritus, Rabbi Gore, here and uh, share this. You should know it's not in every congregation that a Rabbi Emeritus and a new senior rabbi actually get along. <laughs> so far, yeah. Most. It's mostly helped when one lives about 10,000 miles away from the other. That really makes for an excellent relationship. But nonetheless, it's been really absolutely wonderful and uh, just a blessing for us. I also, I looked around the congregation and I wanted to notice another blessing for us, which is that uh, all of us kind of have some parents here, which is nice. I noticed that, of course, Evan and Don, Evan, your mom is out here, and that's a wonderful thing. And uh, I noticed that Rabbi Cantor Wissett, I see both of your parents here, along with two of your kids. I don't see, is there a third kid here? He's in the crying room. Okay. So we have, we have three generations are here along with your family, which is a wonderful blessing. And that's just a nice way to be involved. And for me, too, my parents are here with, of course, with me, but also with uh, one of their grandchildren, my other kids, God knows where they are, but uh, so we too on the, the rabbinic side have uh, that too, and that's a wonderful, wonderful blessing to be able to share the holy days, uh, all of us together as family. That's very, very nice. To move to something, of course, the Misha Barak also reminds us that, that things may need some help and some assistance and some blessing. Canner Mark was supposed to be with us on the Bema tonight, and he's had to attend to a private matter. He's healthy, he's fine, he's good. Um, he asked if he could take care of that, but we had scheduled him to be with us to share the pulpit with all of us. He sends his regards and his apologies, and our thoughts are with him as he uh, helps give support to some people he cares about. And of course, we know that the Misha Berach comes to uh, mostly in, in our venue give us blessings of healing and blessings uh, for health, whether you are someone who has a physical ailment or perhaps you're someone who's suffering emotionally or has had a difficult year, difficult day, difficult hour, whatever it may be, this is a wonderful time for you to remember that person who is uh, close to you. Um, one thing that I did yesterday in our service because during uh, the, the, the Holy Day service, we don't actually call out names that we're going to. And I want to remind you that this is an option. You could actually say your own name. We never think that you're a caregiver. We never think that you could actually say your own name as someone who really needs a blessing. And I, I did this at one of the services yesterday. And I had some people come up to me and almost in tears thank me giving them permission to actually say their own name as the Misha Vera. And most people didn't say any name out loud, but clearly people felt that they needed a blessing. And that's okay. You, you don't have to only offer a blessing for someone else. However, at this time, whether it is you, whether it's someone you love or someone you care about, if there's someone in your life that would benefit from a blessing of healing, healing of the body or healing of the spirit, I ask that as one congregation, we say the name aloud. Okay, well, let's say the name.
why Don's here. It's a good life. <laughs> this evening, Rabbi Aronson and I wanted to share some reflections on what's happening in Israel. Let me take one step back, a personal moment, because people are often have been asking me the last two or three days questions about our lives. So let me give you one little glimpse into what we're doing, Evan and I, and then we'll talk a little bit about the situation. Um, in my sermon on Rosh Hashanah, I mentioned walking to work, but I didn't say what work was. And people said, what? I work for Arts of World Travel, which is the travel branch of the reform movement. I help synagogues and rabbis and cantors and educators create their trips to Israel, their itinerary, their educational program. I help them build their trips. So my joy is to help bring people to Israel. That's part of my sense of Zionism. So that's what I do. It's part-time because I do want to have some time in that other part of life that's enjoyable. Um, our life is really wonderful. We're living in a beautiful apartment in Jerusalem. My mother-in-law has been there and stayed with us for a few weeks. Uh, we actually just purchased a new apartment this week that we're going to remodel in Jerusalem on our same block and uh, make our lives there, we hope, right? We hope we make it through remodeling. Um, <laughs> It, try to do that in a foreign language. I realized today, someone asked me, we have an architect because we're moving walls, and I've only spoken with her in Hebrew, and I hope I understand what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows where the walls will end up being? Um, Evan received his PhD last year. He'd been working for a number of years to get a PhD uh, at BU, Boston University, in music education, and he's doing work really in three different worlds. He teaches cantorial students at the Hebrew Union College, our Reform Movement Seminary in Jerusalem. He also, what are the three worlds? Oh, he's doing something I, I yearn to do, the part of retirement, is achieve a goal you've always wanted to do. Evan is going to a conservatory of music, partnered with the Berklee School of Music in Boston, studying jazz vocal. He's, always, he's a classically trained singer, and he's always wanted to sing jazz. I'm talking for you, but or about you. <laughs> Um, so one day a week, he's in Tel Aviv studying with kids who are just out of the army and Evan, their grandfather. <laughs> and on top of that, building on his research from his PhD, he's working with um, Massa programs. If you know what Massa is, Massa is a gap year, often either between high school and college or after college before work. And he's working on creating Jewish identity with Israelis and Americans through music. What does it mean to have a Jewish identity? Is, interestingly enough, I'll come to this in a minute at the end of my talk, um, Israelis don't necessarily have a Jewish identity. They have a very strong Israeli identity, but they don't necessarily know a lot about our tradition. They know the holidays because they follow the calendar. But if you begin to ask them, what, what do you do on Shabbat? What do you do on Shavuot? What do you do on different holidays? We would do much better, those of us sitting in this room, than most Israelis. And so Evan's work is to help them, through music, create a sense of Jewish identity. So our lives are, are really, really wonderful, although I have to say, and then I'll move into the other part, that being here is a reminder that even though we have a wonderful community, and we've met many people, both Israeli and expat Americans, that we spend time with, it's not the same. It's, it's just not. Even on Shabbat, where we belong to a synagogue, we pay dues to our synagogue. Um, <laughs> Full news? <laughs> I, hold on. I'm going to tell you two things about the shul. Number one, the executive director was so good. When we joined, dues are pretty low because for Orthodox synagogues in Israel, it's free. So Reform synagogues can't charge a lot because if they do, people will just go to where it's free. So dues are fairly inexpensive. You have different levels, but it's still, as we left, the executive director said, many Americans who still have money in the United States choose to make a tax-deductible donation from the United States. <laughs> so we were able to do that, just like a pillar here adds to their dues, we added. The executive added. director was trained by Elvis. <laughs> no, but the, the fun part is high holidays in Israel are not a big thing. People go to synagogue, you just show up, you do your thing. The rabbis I'm friends with, they write their sermon that day. It's literally not such, it misses some of the beauty and formality that we have. But I emailed the executive director of our shul because we hadn't rejoined. I emailed last week and I got an out-of-office bounce back that he's on vacation for two weeks. <laughs> That's, <Bye>. yeah, goodbye, <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> 
I don't think he walks around with a walkie-talkie at services, I can tell you that. So that's a little glimpse into our lives. We're really creating a wonderful chapter that we had dreamed of, and it's, it's been lovely for us. Um, I want to jump to what it felt like during the war and really give you, it's funny, this morning I talked about dual or multiple personalities. Um, that's, in a sense, what it was like to live in Israel during the war. It was not that frightening, and I say that on a large scale. When a, the first time the siren went off, we were really scared. We were driving in our car. We had no, no rockets had come towards Jerusalem at all. We really felt false sense of safety. And here the siren goes off, and we literally pulled over, ran into an apartment building that luckily had the front door open and, and stood under the stairwell. It's interesting that the Iron Dome, which really created the sense of safety that we all felt in Israel, you hear it. It's very interesting. What happens is you hear the siren. You have in Jerusalem, what did we have, a minute and a half? Maybe something like that um, to get to a shelter. And once you're in the shelter, very quickly you hear the Iron Dome blow up the rocket. And it's a very loud, what I learned from a physicist or someone who knows physics, there's nothing to block the sound when it's up in the sky. And so it could be 20 miles away, but that boom is very, very loud. And the government never tells you where it was going to fall. So you have no idea. You just hear the very loud boom, and then you wait a few minutes because you have to wait before the shrapnel might fall, and then you come out. So it sounds very frightening, and it is the moment that the siren goes off, and the siren is very, very loud. I remember as a child the nuclear sirens we used to have once a month. Huge magnitude louder than that. It's very frightening at the moment. You run to the shelter. In our office, in our shelter, they put a big box of snack food. <laughs> they figured it should be fun. We had popcorn and peanuts and all these things. In our, By the way, they only lasted from the first siren. By the time the second siren came, there was no food <laughs> left in the snack box. Um, <laughs> on one sense, it was a false uh, feeling of safety. One other glimpse, and then I'll talk about it in a larger sense. I did go with a group of rabbis. I created a solidarity mission for Reform rabbis, and we took them. I was shocked that the army allowed us. We went right to the Gaza border in the middle of the war. You would think it would be a closed zone. You could drive right to the border, which we did. We had an army briefing on a hill. While we were on the hill, an Israeli drone came overhead and shot a missile right into Gaza. We saw the building blow up. We saw tanks coming and going, sirens, rockets going in all directions. It felt very different in Stayrot than it did in Jerusalem. You would not want to live. We met with a young man who's about 21 who hasn't been out of his apartment in three or four years. He has PTSD from the rockets that keep coming, and he just won't leave his apartment. He doesn't feel safe at all. So it's a completely different feeling than it was in Jerusalem uh, for us. We were in Tel Aviv. We tried to go surfing with Diane's friend's family. We're learning paddle surfing. That's one of the crazy things we're doing. And during the war, you could see the rockets going while you're out surfing at the beach. It's a very interesting life. So that's the dual personality piece. There's a slight underlying fear. There's a very deep anxiety. And what I really want to lead to in my last part is I think what it really created in Israeli society is a deep depression. That we really, really felt this same war had been fought last year. It had been fought a few years before that. And heaven forbid, but we believe it's going to be fought again. And so even though there was a sense of safety and we didn't feel that really our lives, if, if you really look at it, soldiers aside, only four civilian Israelis were killed in this war. Iron Dome was really miraculous. It really saved us all. Sixty some odd soldiers, 67 I think soldiers died. And I could tell you stories about families we know whose kids were there, horrible stories. But the underlying depression in Israeli society is, is there any way out? Is this really just going to be repeated over and over again? Um, I won't get into my politics of that. Maybe on Tuesday when I'm here hanging out more informally, I'll talk about my own personal politics and reaction. But there is a, definitely a deep depression. Our lives during the war were great. Seems strange to say that we went to movies, we went surfing, we went out to dinner. You're aware when you're at dinner there's a lot of glass in that restaurant and where are you going to go if a siren goes off? Those are things you're always conscious of. But our lives went on. 
we were in Tel Aviv. You weren't allowed to have more than 300 people in one place as a government rule. And so services outdoors in Shabbat in Tel Aviv usually have about 1,000 people. They move back to their synagogue. There were only about 300. But we had a wonderful Shabbat. We had a great Shabbat dinner. A siren went off right in the middle of saying Kiddush. We went in, in a high, we were on the 25th story of a high rise in a gorgeous apartment. And um, you go to the reinforced stairwell. All the stairwells are reinforced. And I think it's a rule that we should all, we learned as kids. Everybody came from Shabbat dinner and they were eating their food. And I thought they should have brought to share with everybody else. It wasn't nice to be in the, in the stairwell without all the food. But my biggest worry for Israel is what's next. The sense of depression that came out of this war. Is there really any hope? Is there any hope that we can achieve the peace that we really, really want? Those on the very left wing argued somewhat forcefully that this was a war of choice. Most of us believe very clearly because of the rockets and the tunnels it wasn't. Those on the very left wing believe had we sat down with the Palestinians and allowed the United States to force us into a peace agreement, this war didn't have to happen. That only a few months ago, John Kerry was sitting at the table with us and we said Abbas was the bad guy and wouldn't come to an agreement. And what was Netanyahu saying throughout the entire war? He wants Abbas to now police Hamas, which is an agreement that came out today in Aretz. So we're really in a period of time where we don't know. And let me wrap up with our Torah portion from the week, Ha'azinu. Moses is saying goodbye. And in his goodbye speech, his greatest concern is not the physical safety of the people of Israel. They're out of Egypt. They're right on the border of Jordan, looking at Israel. He knows they're going to go into Israel. He knows that physically they're safe. His entire goodbye message is a spiritual message of who are these people going to be once they get into the land. And I think that's the biggest question that Israel is facing today. Who is Israel going to be? Is it going to be a nation that's constantly at war, that sees no way out, that's population is very depressed because they feel hopeless? Or is it going to be a nation that really stands up for the values and morals of, of Zionism that I spoke a little bit about in my sermon? And if you're downstairs, you'll hear it on Yom Kippur. Will those morals and values lead us to a next chapter that can be a more peaceful and a more hopeful chapter? Those are a few comments. Rabbi Aronson. So, you know, in some ways I feel as though here almost had more tension about the war than there was almost in Israel to some degree. Um, because nerves were frayed. I don't know if you experienced the, uh, the, the Facebook phenomenon of losing friends on Facebook because of somebody posting about this war. But it's become a very, for many years now, a very difficult environment to talk about some of the crucial issues that Israel faces. And just this week, there was a front page article in the New York Times about the fact that ra virtually no rabbis are speaking about Israel this year in any real political way during the holy days. Happily, I'm not one of them, and I will be speaking about Israel on Yom Kippur. So those of you who will be up here will get an opportunity to hear that. And uh, there's just a few comments uh, you know, with this that I would take, that, 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 that I would offer. One. The idea that it's impossible to talk about what goes on in Israel, I hear this refrain a lot, because we don't live there. This is something that's very, very important to me and something that doesn't really sit and fall on me that well. People say, well, you, you really, your only stance if you don't live in Israel is that you should just kind of either be yay or nothing. And I don't really believe that. Israel is an enterprise of the Jewish people. And I think all of us have a stake in, the, in, in Israel, whether or not we live there. There are certain people who have made an affirmative choice to live in Israel for many great reasons, and they have a unique stake in it. By the way, there is a lot of people, and, and, and Rabbi Gore can speak to this, who haven't really made any more of an affirmative choice to live in Israel than someone who's born into America after 10 generations has made to live in America. Um, but regardless, you, even if you don't, make Aliyah, can make an affirmative choice to be part of these people who, whose national enterprise is the state of Israel. 
and therefore we do have a stake in what goes on, and these issues that we confront are vital to us, are important to us, and say something about us, and that leads me to my next point, which is that to say that we have, one of my observations is to say that we have not, you know, we don't live in Israel, therefore, you know, it's, it's not ours except just to say yay. I think that argument was completely deflated this year as we saw the breakout of anti-Semitism around the world in response to when, what went on in Israel. I think more than any other time in my kind of cognizant life, we saw that phenomenon evolve, and it's scary. And here's some of the things that I took away from that. If it's really about Israel, why are you protesting in front of a synagogue? If it's not about Jews, why are you protesting in front of a synagogue? You don't go and if you're protesting against France, there's a lot of good reasons to protest against France. If you're protesting against France, you don't go find a French restaurant and start protesting. You go to the French embassy or you go to the French consulate and you protest against France or against Germany, etc. If 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 it isn't anti-Semitism that leads people to where they are in terms of Israel, why do they in France surround people in synagogues and make it impossible for them to leave? So that to me speaks to this idea, we're all invested as Jews, whether you've made that decision to live in Israel or not, we're all invested in Jews in the central enterprise of the Jewish people, which is the state of Israel. And I think that's a very, if that lesson has not been learned yet, it should clearly be learned by virtue of the tremendous anti-Semitism that I think is, is creeping in all different places uh, around the world as well. And then the other thing, and then we'll kind of open it to questions, is in America, in North America, and I speak to my colleagues, and I'm sure that uh, my colleagues do as well, it's very difficult to stand up here speak in North America about Israel and keep friends. It, it really is. It, it, it is, there's nothing that I'm going to say definitively that probably won't make a bunch of you upset because we've become so polarized on this that we, we really are unwilling to understand that there has to be some opportunity for some, some dialogue. And um, I'm going to actually address this specific issue in terms of the state of Israel on Yom Kippur. And I'll be fascinated to see uh, what your response is going to be and how quickly you call Rabbi Gore in Jerusalem and <laughs> beg him to come back. So it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very difficult. You'd only hear worse from me, so uh, it's okay. It's a very difficult environment to live in. And uh, I think now it's a good time to open up to some questions for either Rabbi Gore or me or both. Or we can go home. Marla. Marla. Hi. It's about an hour and a half drive from Tel Aviv to Repeat Gaza. The question, please. It's how, what's the distance? It's about an hour and a half from Tel Aviv to Gaza. But technologically, it's important to know that the reason Iron Dome works so well and Israel felt safe, Hamas doesn't have technology. God willing, they won't, but the reality is they will at some time. The difference between a rocket and a missile is a rocket is a projectile sent off and you don't know where it's going to land, right? As a kid, if you've ever built one of those, they go up and you see where they go. A missile has a, def has a uh, guiding mechanism. Israel has missiles, and we guide it towards the buildings, and God willing, it's the right building. Hamas is just sending off rockets, and you don't know where they're going to land. But they don't have great distance. And what was new in this war is that they were able to hit Jerusalem a few times, only a few times, um, Tel Aviv a lot, pretty often. Great technology piece we don't know is that Israel's, the radar system, there's actually a, an office and they watch the rockets and within 30 seconds, they decide which alarms are gonna go off in which neighborhoods, not the whole city of Jerusalem goes off. They're able to know which neighborhood that rocket's heading towards. And they actually believe in the next war that God willing won't come, they're gonna be able to do it block by block. 
that's how good their, their systems are becoming. I'll take a quick. I, I, I met a journalist who writes for the Boston Globe, or did for another month. Um, her perspective was fascinating to me. She said that we, we all know the stories about Israel bureaucratically. We've lived it, what it means to live in Israel, that they're not organized. They sell great software systems to the United States of America so that the DMV can work here. Nothing works in that country. You stand in line. Why are Israelis pushy? If there are any Israelis here, I've become really pushy. You should see me yell and scream um, because you need to get into the front of the line, right? So what the journalist said to me is very interesting, that all the spokespeople in the IDF spokesperson's office are, I forget the word, they're hired, they're brought up in the army by the head guy, and he likes them. What's that word when you're... you're ne it's patriot patronage, nepotism, whatever it is, the head of the IDF spokesperson office has no training in communications. According to her, not a single person in the spokesperson's office of the IDF has training. They're told that they'll be funded by Americans, by federations, will help them do better. No, they need to bring up their friends from the army to a higher rank so they get a better job in the army. So one answer that I heard actually is that Israel does a poor job at communicating because they have very poor people in the responsible places to get out the information. My other quick, quick answer would be, I think whenever you're the person in power, you get criticized. We think of ourselves as the underdog. The world does not see us as the underdog. When we've got missiles and rockets and all the technology, they're the underdog, and I think in the media, media likes to play up the underdog. I, I would just add quickly to that. I think Israel, Israel's interested in telling the world why, why it's right, rather than telling the world a sympathetic story that works well in public relations. It took a long time in this war. I, I was shocked, I would, I would say, say to Debbie, why isn't somebody taking uh, somebody through the tunnels and showing, and finally, you know, weeks into the war, finally there's Wolf Blitzer in the tunnels. Okay, that's good. Why isn't Benjamin Netanyahu standing out in some neighborhood where they are having a, 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 a drill, or not even a drill, where they are all sc scurrying to the bomb shelters, and why aren't they showing that on TV? Their, their public relations, their hot parade, their, their is, is, is absolutely terrible. It's, it's shocking. Jews were the people who invented the popeal pocket fisheries and sold that to everybody. And it's incredible that somehow we're unable to sell something as wonderful and as meaningful as Israel. But I, I think, and, and I think Netanyahu, with whatever you think of him, he doesn't come across as a sympathetic figure in the media. He comes across as stern. He comes across as a, a bit of a bully. I, this is not, I'm not saying anything about his politics. I'm just saying, you know, it would be better to probably have, you know, if they could get, you know, Natalie Portman out there talking about Israel. I think seriously. Scarlett Johansson, she did a Scarlett commercial. It's a, it's a yeah. video world we live in. Netanyahu doesn't sell. But it's the way that Israel works. They want him in front. He wants to be in front. That's absolutely he right. doesn't have a communication specialist who's got a degree in communications. Shocking. Martine. Um, Islamic State, I have to say, Evan and I joked a lot that during the war you become very right-wing. Evan and I happen to be pretty left-wing, but you become very right-wing. You're very in favor of the army doing everything it can to end this war with Hamas, no matter what pain, because you don't want to be in danger. And I think Israel feels the same way about Islamic State. Don't come near us, because while the U.S. is very willing to tactically play against the Islamic State, Israel will make sure that there's no Islamic State. And, and I think that that's just the strong feeling. And, and what we've read, what we've read in Haaretz, one of the links I'm going to send out, you have to read Haaretz and Jerusalem Post every day, um, is that there's an agreement between Jordan and Israel that if Islamic State comes into Jordan, Israel will defend Jordan. That's what we read.
at the end, we will remind me. We'll take some more questions. But at the end of this, that'll be the way we sum up this little segment. We'll talk about the great adult education program on Israel. It's a great idea. So I know Harvey will throw your hand up, and then we'll go to Ira. It's a really interesting discussion, and, and here I'm going to be really... Uh, the question is oh, thank that you. Israel has really controls a lot of the infrastructure of the territories, and like water and currency and a variety of banking in many ways, so why doesn't Israel just put a halt to that until the situation is resolved? Um, I think that Israel, here's really where the Jewish values come to the fore. Israel learned a lot from the first Iraq and the second Iraq war. The United States tried to, and Afghanistan. You hear this a lot in Israeli press. The United States tried regime change, and we failed. And Netanyahu repeated that constantly during the war. You can't go into Gaza and force a regime change. It's going to fail. We'll have our soldiers in there. They'll be ambushed forever, and we'll never be able to leave. He really felt that. And I think the Jewish value here that really does motivate the government of Israel is we can't, there's enough hate coming from the two sides, that if we really shut off the water, we did not bomb the electrical power plant in Gaza until towards the end of the war. That's how we, long we left full electricity in Gaza. I think that we really believe that we can't deepen the hate. If we have any hope for there to be peace, it can't come out of more hate that we took away their water, we took away their food, we took away their electricity. That will lead to maybe them begging for peace, but how long would that kind of peace last? It's a, right, as much as we want to make sure we're secure, on the other hand, we have to, the happier that, it, that the Palestinians are, because by the way, it's a total tangent, we take groups, the reform movement, to, to Ramallah. Come visit Ramallah. You'll see that there's a state being built. Netanyahu should spend time in Ramallah. It's a thriving city. You can get sushi, right? I went with Jerry. Um, you can get your sushi there. You can stay at the Novotel. There's the Department of Transportation, Department of Education, the Department of Treasury, and they are very happy there. They're building a state. They got Bain is there, right? The companies are there, investing in companies there. Those people don't want to be terrorists because the fact is their lives are pretty good. And, and Ramallah is a thriving, wonderful place to visit. I wouldn't go there right now. But in a few months, I hope that we'll be able to be taking groups back there because that's the Palestine we want to see. And it doesn't come out of cutting off their water. It comes by giving them more. Ila, you're going to have, uh, unfortunately, the last question. Unfortunately for everybody else, not for you. Ella, but, uh, time is strictly away. Well, you guys are, no, you're in the downstairs sanctuary, and you'll hear my talk about Zionism, and she needs to be there, because part of my answer is we need to be proud. We don't need to be afraid to be Zionist. We don't need to be afraid to support Israel. She needs to be proud and to turn around and say, we've created a wonderful thing here, and maybe you, the anti-Semite, don't know how wonderful this is, and let me tell you why it's wonderful. So I think being proud 
and standing up and being proud is a very important way to counter what's, what's in the world. And my last statement will be, it's in my sermon, Yair Lapid, who's the finance minister in the government currently, um, said that Israel was formed not to get rid of anti-Semitism, because we can't, but rather to tell them to get lost. Because we can do that now. Um, I, I would add to that, I agree with Rabbi Gore, that we can't, we can't teach people anything about anti-Semitism that is in the end that helpful. What we can teach our kids is what it means to be a Jew, what are the values that we esteem, why is the world a better place with Jews in it, and give them the tools, as Rabbi Gore's saying, to be proud Jews and to be able to understand that uh, racial prejudice and, and religious prejudice and prejudice of all types exists. And like any other form of prejudice, it's never the form, it's never the fault of the victim. And the only thing we can do is give people the tools to, to really stand up and, and be able to speak to that and, and to be proud because they know that the world is a better place with Jews in it, which goes back to Mark Novak's point, which is that the Adult Education Committee has designated Israel as the topic for the year. And we'll be doing a whole series of events that focus on Israel that'll include a 15-part uh, series being taught by me. Uh, both Rabbi Gore and I share a common uh, relationship with the Hartman Institute, and I'm going to be teaching one of their pr programs, I Engage. And uh, it's, it's a fabulous program invite you to come out. We're also going to be in January hosting, uh, very un very proud to say, we're bringing together two groups, different points along the political spectrum. Stand With Us and J Street are going to be here in a discussion moderated by me, where we're going to talk about what people think about uh, uh, Israel. We also have a scholar in residence, actually, with the good help of Rabbi Gore. Uh, Rachel Korazim has uh, really fabulous, fabulous I mean, I know, Don, you've studied with her um, probably far more than I have. It's going to come around Israel Independence Day, the Shabbat of Israel Independence Day. Be here. It's no, no cost to come and hear her speak. And she's going to talk to us about and learn. This is a great thing to bring kids. Learn through wonderful poetry and through literature about the proud, his, some proud points of being a Jew, of what it means to support Israel and things like that. That's just a little taste. Our rabbinic intern, Sam Spector, is also teaching some courses on Israel. Some of those will be during the day, for those of you who can't make it in the evening. So a lot, a lot of things that are going on about Israel over the course of the next nine months. And uh, I don't know when, is, is the postcard out yet, uh, Ellen? Is it even standing here? It'll be available Yom Kippur with all the dates, all the information, and everything all ready to go. So. Thank you very much, Rabbi Gore. Thank you very much. Let's conclude the service. How about that? Okay. <laughs> Who has observed a birthday in the past week? Because you are entitled to come up and help open the ark. And we're flexible on what that means. You could have observed a birthday in the past eight days, ten days. Could be tomorrow. Could be Monday. We're flexible. We have some something to play with. A week from now. But Actually, I, you can't come up next Friday night because it's Kol Nidre. So even if you uh, you want to, two weeks. Come on up. Next week, excellent. Come on up. We're going to rise the congregation. Page five hundred eighty-six. Aleinu l'shamea Adon hakol Latin kidu la leotzeh erishit Shelo asanu kegel yeharatzot Velo samanu kemishpechot ha'adama Shelo samchel keinu kahem Begur aleinu kechol ha'monam V'anachnu Yeah.
let us recall loved ones whom death has recently taken, those who died at this season in years past, those whom we have brought into our hearts with our own. If there is among us anyone who is observing the mourning period of the Shiva, the seven-day mourning period, and you wish to remember a loved one, I invite you to rise at your seat and remember your loved one aloud. anyone among us who is in the mourning period of the Shloshim, the 30-day mourning period, and you wish to remember a loved one, I invite you to rise at your seat and remember the name of your loved one aloud, please. anyone among us who's observing yard site this Shabbat, which is to say the anniversary of the death of a loved one, or anyone who is still in the year-long period of mourning, you wish to remember a loved one, I invite you to rise at your seat and remember your loved one at this juncture. May their memories be a blessing to their loved ones. We rise as one congregation. The Kaddish is on page 598. Amen. Yehi Shmei Rabba Mevarach Le'olam Ulaume Almaya Yitbarach V'yishtabach V'yitpa'ar V'yitramam V'yitnase V'yithadar V'yitale V'yithalal Shemei Nekud Shach Frichu Le'ela Min Kol Birchata V'shirata Tushbechata V'nechem Ata Dam Yiran V'alma V'yimru Amen Yehi Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya V'chaim Aleinu V'al Kol Yisrael V'yimru O Seshalom bim Romav, Hu Yasse Shalom, Aleinu Vel Kol Yisrael, Bimru Amen. May the source of peace and peace to all who mourn, comfort to breathe among us. Let us say together, Amen. Extend a hand in friendship to those around you. Wish one another Shabbat Shalom. We we do not have any B'nai Mitzvah tomorrow. Cantor Kent. There you go, you can have some. Cantor Kent. There you go. 600, uh, 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 123, yes. No, no. Baruch Atadonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Borei Peri HaGafen Baruch Atadonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kiddishanu B'mitzvotav V'ratzavahanu V'shabbat Kodesho B'yahava V'ratzon Hinchilanu Zikaron L'mahasei V'reishit Ki hu yom techila L'mikra HaKodesh Zeche L'tziat Mitzrayim someone from the congregation to do this, but it's a chala, Rabbi Gore, Cantor Kent, stand next to one another. <laughs> Rabbi Cantor Wissett on the other side. Uh, somebody have a, ca on this side. Somebody have a camera. Let's put this on Facebook immediately. This, this, I, I, think, I think Ellen is doing that. We are all, 
we are all going to touch the challah or touch someone who's touching the challah to celebrate the joy of the new year. We are all going to stand together, thrilled for the fellowship. Over on that, on that aisle over there, that side. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Don't be shy. Who's that? Isla. Shy? Over shy? here. Make sure. There we go. Ready? Let us rejoice with the mozi. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.